are showcasing elements of virtual production. I have with me here Mr. Evan Bolter, BSC, who recently shot your favorite episodes of The Last of Us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, Marvel's uh, Secret Invasion. Before we get into that, I want to thank our week partners here. We have View Studios. We'll give it up for View Studios. And we have Row Creative Displays. Give it up for Row. All right. What we're really showing off is the different ways that you can have your, your lighting interact with your environment. So to start off, how did you get into this crazy world of movie making, cinematography? I was one of those uh, people, I, I happened to have a 5D when uh, that firmware update came out that, that did video mode. Um, I'd been shooting like corporate videos, mini DV. Uh, I, didn't, I don't even think I knew what a cinematographer was, if I'm honest. Um, but I'd always been a huge uh, movie geek and I'd gone into this world of making little videos and then I kind of realized with, when the 5D came out that maybe I could start to edge towards that world. And I started doing short films. Uh, you know, I got into kind of a group of friends in London um, and it kind of became a let's make a short film every single week. On every job I learned something new. I was always trying to use new equipment, new ideas to lighting, new approaches. It truly was like a, a scattergun approach to if there's a project that needs a DP, I am a DP and I'll give it a go. And I was the worst DP in the whole world. And on every little project, I, I got a tiny bit better and learned something and tried something. And in the end, I did about a hundred short films, which is sort of ridiculous, but that was my film school. Um, I figured I, um, from the very beginning, I was a cinematographer. I looked at the kind of uh, ACing route and it just wasn't for me. I was a terrible AC. I was t more interested in the lighting and the, the monitors. So I just decided to commit be a, a cinematographer and you know the projects got bigger I did feature films I got an agent and I've, I've kept on blagging it until today as I got on bigger and bigger sets bigger and bigger projects the imposter syndrome was incredibly real but I just thought do you know what like every DP ever has stepped onto a big set for the first time and been in, responsible for lighting it so let's just jump in and instead of thinking about what should I do you it's like do you know what let's approach it with fresh eyes and I'll do my version and maybe the crew are gonna think who's this idiot or, you know whatever uh, but maybe someone's gonna go actually that's different it's an interesting approach and it leads somewhere so that's always been something I've leaned into um, and you know virtual it, it, it is a new sort of part of that it's a new thing for a lot of people and I'm sort of trying to not be scared of it and trying to sort of approach it head on and see what I can get out of it. Um, and, and even if I use it differently to other people, yeah. Were there any films that you saw either as a kid or young adult that you helped, that you feel helped push you in this direction? Yeah, uh, very definitively it was Jurassic Park. I, I, was, I was 10 years old, I was sat in the cinema um, and I, I've got a younger sister, she's seven. And I just, I remember feeling how scared she was by the dinosaurs. And then I also remember having to pretend to not be terrified myself. And as a 10 year old, I just sort of realized this thing was having this great effect on me that was so, um, you know, well, you've seen it, it's good. Um, and, and that was when I kind of figured out what a director was because I think my mom was like, hey, you should watch Indiana Jones, you know? Hey, do you remember that film E.T. you liked, you know? And I kind of put together that there was a person responsible for these magical things. And so, yeah, that kind of started the sort of Spielberg kid in me, um, which is still there. Are there any recent films that you feel like, you know, that's, that's, that's what I'm going for, that's the style? I think as a cinematographer, I'm still figuring out who I am. Um, and I have taste, I have my own things that I like, but I still approach every project as a sort of, a, a bit of a blank canvas. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna morph into who this needs me to be. So for The Last of Us, there's a very, you know, clear aesthetic to what that is. And when I did a Marvel series, it's completely different. And I, I actually take, I guess, pride in being able to do both and, and be very different projects to project. And talking about virtual production, how is the, the role of the DP evolved? What, what really uh, separates out traditional production from virtual production for DP? The main thing is it's new, it's in its infancy. So there's no simple answer to that. I think where it's, it's changing, it's evolving, where everyone's figuring it out. I have, I've done it a few times now and have my approach, things I've learned, but every single project 
you're sort of starting again with with new people and new tools and the technology is changing every day and and you know you just got to try and keep up and i've always been a, a cinematographer not afraid of technology and new things and it has been something i've sort of sought out to to try so that i can find out all the things wrong with it and help to improve those things and help to help to just go in with my eyes open to a project. You know, we've got location work and studio work, and that's what it's been for a very long time now. And, and in that, in, with those two, it's a case of making our studio work and our set builds feel like a location. I, I, that's always the goal for me. It's something like The Last of Us, with, you know, it's half location, half set. Hopefully you can't tell the difference, if you know what I mean. Um, that's the goal for me. Virtual production gives us like a third way to do the studio thing. So instead of relying on green screen, instead of having to build so extensively, we, we can use this uh, with all kinds of benefits to, to lighting, to framing, to intention, to holding on to the final image and not relying on a process you might not be a part of six months from now. So um, it's just trying to, in a way, it's trying to, to make this work for what we want the scene, the film, the series to be, rather than being led by this and the technology. So that's that's how I'm approaching it at the moment, is this needs to work for what we're trying to do here. And if it doesn't, how can we help it work for it? But, you know, there's a certain point where, okay, this scene just doesn't work on right. virtual. And so those are the conversations that we're having a lot at the moment, yeah. So so go into that a little deeper. What, what makes a scene good for virtual or bad for virtual? And, and how is your role as a DP influencing that? Like, are we building a set? Is this on stage? Is this virtual? Yeah, so I, I think, you know, it, every which way has pros and cons. If, if you go out to the desert to do a sunset shoot, um, you're gonna get in absolutely incredible vistas, the real sun, the real deal, the sand, the wind. It's, it's, it's gonna be Lawrence of Arabia, it's gonna be great. Um, if you're trying to emulate that on a sound stage, you know, let's say without virtual, you're, you're relying on a, a heck of a lot of brilliant VFX artistry and a lot of imagination and a lot of, you know, decision making that gets put down the line. So it's a harder thing to kind of do very well because the decision making process and the sort of authorship of the, of the image is that over a much longer period of time. So with virtual, you, you, can, you can compress all of that and, and the, the cinematographer, the director can be in much closer collaboration with the control of the look. So in the same example of the desert thing, maybe it's like a, an eight page scene at sunset in a desert. Um, and you know, if you're gonna go out and do that on location, you're probably gonna be shooting for two weeks, 15 minutes a day with the sun in the perfect position, hotels, crew, food poisoning, the whole thing. Um, if it's on this, if you can do it well, you can hold the sun in the sky exactly where you want. You can use the ambient volume lighting and you can you know, potentially end up with a, a, a beautiful uh, sunset vista in the comfort of Paramount Studios. That's the, that's the aim. So, you know, there, again, there's just, there are pros and cons and it's just what's, what's most important here. And maybe it's an eight page monologue and it's impossible to do it on location. So here we are, here's a solution. We can do it in camera and it's, you know, hopefully gonna be great. So th those are the conversations. Yeah. But so often the sort of core principle is performance. You know, it is, is understanding where, okay, here is a highly technical scene and it's a, I don't know, a car chase, a, 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 a fire, whatever it is. Right. And, and this is gonna require a lot of cinematography to tell the story. Whereas this is two people talking on a park bench and this is a performance scene and we need to respect that performance. We need control. Um, we wanna control traffic noise. We wanna control where the sun is in the sky. Um, you know, maybe it's a sunset scene and it's eight pages long and you know, we don't want to be shooting 15 minutes per day at sunset over a month. We want to give the actors a 12 hour day and the ability to really get into their performance and not be led by something we can't control. So it's just looking for those, it's, it's always a balance. It's, there's pros and cons, there's push and pull. Um, and you sort of, you know, maybe this is a set, maybe this is a location, maybe this is virtual. And you just kind of go down those avenues and you end up going, well, do you know what, this, this show, we've got a lot that could work in virtual. So let's explore that. That's kind of how it happens. And, and maybe you want a, a city street with no people because you're doing something that uh, you, you meet, you know, locking down Times Square, stuff yep. like that. Yeah, well, yeah exactly. Tons of logistical challenges, yeah. Yeah. So in working in the, the virtual space, um, talk to me a little bit about how you find where you're going because 
a virtual environment can be vast. You could look anywhere. You could look down this corner, that yep. corner. How do you get in there and find your angles because there's there's no limitations, right? Yeah. That feeds into one of the most key things with working with virtual, which is blocking, which is remembering what it is we're doing overall, which is telling a story with human beings, probably, um, who are going to be acting, performing. And so often, the most important thing is their performance and a scene being a great scene. And everything else is, is you know, creating an atmosphere, it's visual storytelling, it's, it's showing the audience where to look, but ultimately you are relying on those performances to really make something great. So I think a, a huge thing with virtual is, uh, and, and angles is really thinking about, um, can we shoot this in a virtual environment without inhibiting the actors to breaking point? Um, because, you know, us here sat on this bench, it's reasonably simple to, to be able to, to, to shoot this as a, almost any which way, right? Um, right? Most shots you could think of, there'd be a way to make it work with this. If I wanted to get up and stroll behind you and get close to that screen and, and walk out, who knows, you know, there's, there's, that's gonna be a big problem. So you really have to think about containing actors, proximity to the screen, what the coverage is going to be. Um, that Whenever I've talked to him prep about if it's virtual or not, it usually ends up with, are they, you know, if they're going to be sat stationary, if it's kind of simple blocking, we've got a good chance of success. If there's seven characters, multiple eye lines, all kinds of crossing, all kinds of chaos, much more complicated, much more difficult. Then you're getting into previs, then you're really having to lock in angles and probably taking away flexibility from the actors. So how does that come into play when you have to shoot green screen for a VFX heavy movie? That's one of the major, I think, advantages because when we're, when we're relying on an incredibly green screen environment, we're having conversations about lighting, about the background. We've maybe seen some previs. We've maybe input on it's a moonlit wood and this is what I'm going to be doing when we go to a real moonlight, moonlight wood. This is what I want to do on the stage. I need your work to fit in with this so that they marry up, so it's invisible. Um, but a lot of that is done on faith, to be honest. You're, you're talking about it, you're maybe seeing an early version, but they're going to be doing the work six months from now, and I'm going to be on another job, probably. Um, and don't get me wrong, a lot of the time, they're going to do incredible work, maybe better than what I was hoping for, but the opposite can be true with time and money and you can kind of get stitched up, frankly, or even with no ill intent, you know, a story can change. And suddenly the scene that I've lit for a moonlight wood becomes a middle of the day sunny wood. What you're doing is bringing that conversation forward to prep and suddenly the previs is actually the final product. So let's really get into lighting it. And, you know, we need to delete that building and, and make the floor shinier. and then we've got it on a screen and we're composing actual composition and using all the benefits of a, a really funky lens and we're committing to something and saying this is baked in and I'm, hopefully we can stand behind it and say this is it um, rather than relying on something six months from then. So it, in your approach to lighting virtual, let's talk about that for a moment. So obviously when you show up to a location, the scene is already lit. For the most part, you'll yeah. bring in your movie lights, you'll add, let's warm that up, cool that down. Mm -hmm. How does that change in a virtual environment? It's pretty much the same. I mean, like when, when it's location work, like you say, you're trying to bring the outside in. You're trying to say, what's the reality of this world? How do we make our studio feel like the real world? Put a sky in, put a sun in, you know, bouncing the grass back, whatever it may be. You're trying to, you're trying to make it feel like a real location that you've manipulated to be cinematic or be romantic or cold or whatever it is. Um, virtual's the same, so um, what is the reality of the environment? What should the light be doing? Let's use the screens, use LED lights, use re old school lights if you want to. Um, let's recreate the reality of that environment and then manipulate it for the story, for the tone, for the shots. The limitations on creativity often force you into a new direction and you make something better. And, and, and I guess one way of, of putting that to, to traditional studio work would be um, car process work. When you're out on the road shooting a car scene, there are so many variables, so many things you can't control. A bumpy car, the sun, the clouds, you know, there's all kinds of real things that you can't control, but it's real. And, and so it doesn't feel fake. And, and you think maybe it would be nice if I could do this, maybe it would be nice if I could do that, but it's real, you know? And so when I come onto the, the stage to do process work with screens and lights, 
I'm often thinking I've got to, I've got to obstruct myself. I can't make it too good because it's going to look fake. I need to bounce the car more than we think, make the windows a bit dirtier than you expect and make the lighting imperfect because I wouldn't have full control to put the sun exactly where I want it on every single angle. So unfortunately this is front lit. And let's just do some little things to make it a little bit better, but don't cross into that realm of, um, of too fake. So with virtual, it's the same thing. It's, it's, you know, the options are limitless, but let's limit ourselves. Let's keep it on planet Earth. Let's, you know, let's not break um, with the rules of physics. And let's try and sort of inconvenience ourselves a little bit so it, we've got a better chance of tricking people that it's a real location. Because I think, personally, that's the ultimate goal. It's not saying, wow, that's good looking virtual. It's saying, wow, that was a great scene. So in talking about virtual production, how does, what are, what are some of the challenges that happen in virtual production that you don't get in studio or, or location production? Well, yeah, I mean, the main thing is it's new. Uh, it's, it's absolutely in its infancy. And I think there is no expectation really that any DP knows what they're doing with it because, or well, maybe Greg Frazier, <laughs> and, you know, there's a few, yeah, but, right. but it, it's so new and it's so expensive and it's so complicated that, um, again, I'm leaning into that idea of, I'm not expected to know how Unreal Engine works, but as a cinematographer, I can say, um, this is what I'd love for it to be able to do. And how do I, how do I incorporate it into to the, the story, into the film? You know, just like we would with a, a normal physical set, um, I'm lighting it to, to, to represent a reality and then a cinematic reality for storytelling. And I'm maybe relying on VFX or a trans light or a 2D LED screen to, to further bake in that look and ground that environment. And this is just another version of that. It's an extension of that with pros and cons. So uh, to close this out, what, mm. as a DP, what, what advice would you give to someone starting now? Uh, yeah, I, I think, yeah, because I'm, I was that person and um, I think it's all about individualism and anything that you do from your voice that makes it more yours, more distinctive, more true to yourself, just follow those instincts. That is where you're creating something of, of worse, even if, you know, whatever small worth it is. If it's your handwriting, there's something personal in there that, that someone is going to hopefully react to. And I think the worst thing you can do is try to copy anyone. Uh, and, and sure, you know, uh, I, I guess by copying something, maybe the, the, the extent to which you fail may create something new. That's definitely a thing. And then make sure you learn something, you know? I, sometimes my approach at the beginning was very scattergun. It was, if I'm shooting, I'm learning. I'm, I'm maybe earning money, I'm, you know, I'm, trying a new piece of kit. And if ever I found myself in a situation where it's like, I've done this before, it'd be like, okay, well, let's, let's do something different. Let's do a, a near side key instead of a far side key. Let's front light it. Let's top light it. Let's use a focal length I've never used before. Let's get wide and close. I, you know, on every project, try and learn one thing and you just keep on building like that. Um, and yeah, that's something I still do now. I, I think if ever I feel like this is copy paste, um, this is incredibly familiar to something I've done before that instantly kind of sets off an alarm that I'm being lazy and not learning and it's boring and it is very you know we have little shortcuts to success I think with lighting a scene where you think I know that works and and obviously you tap into that for speed yeah. for, for reliability but it's just great when you can step away from that and be bolder and take more risks great uh, last call for questions or Evan today. Yes, sir. So, the question is, what are some qualities of a director that you like working with? Every project's different, right? I, I think the truth to the, uh, that answer is I want to get on with them. I, I, I love what I do being a cinematographer. I think it's a real privilege to tell stories. People have people watch them. Like this is a dream job. I, I am fully aware of how lucky I am to do what I do. And I don't want to be in a position where I'm going to work with somebody I don't like, you know, and having a hard time and it being grumpy and shouty. And I, I'm, a, I'm a positive person who, and I love what I do. And when I first meet a director, a lot of it is a chemistry test to do we like each other? Because um, I think you need to be, to an extent, friends. You need to talk, you need to, you know, on days off, you want to be, go for lunch and chat about how the shoot's going and that not be a burden. It should be a You're thing. A it's a collaborator. I mean, really, you, you've, the two of you have to be together. Um, 
So that's the first thing I look for. And, and then whether a director is incredibly specific with visual storytelling or, or gives a lot of it to me, I don't mind either way. Um, both have advantages. A, a very visual director sort of requires much more from me and pushes me further and takes me out of my comfort zone and, and maybe, you know, makes me do something I never would have done otherwise. And, and a director who's kind of like, look, I'm not good at shots. So I don't, you know, make it feel like this. That kind of brings another thing out of me, which is getting more into directing myself or more into constructing a scene. And I just sort of, I like both. So it just depends. Great, thank you. Well, I'd like to thank Mr. Evan Bolter for joining us here today. Let's give it up for Evan. Thank you, thank you. Thank you.